many slides you bring about? I can bring it down. I would bring it down on the screen so the screen's easier and easier for live stream. Yeah, yeah. I think that sounds fine. Yeah, great. Are you starting or somebody introducing me? Duncan's introducing me. Yeah, so we just will have to adjust this. Okay. Welcome. 
Welcome to the 29th uh, Energy and Resources Group Annual Lecture. My name is Duncan Calloway. I'm the chair of ERG, and I want to thank you all for coming to celebrate another successful year at ERG, and especially to celebrate the incredible career of Kathy Koshland. <laughs> um, I want to begin with uh, um, a land statement. So I'm going to begin by reading this acknowledgement, and I want to acknowledge that I'm reading this, but with deep sincerity. Uh, UC Berkeley sits on the territory of the Huchun, the original landscape of the Chichenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. And this region continues to be of great importance to the Muwekma Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Ver Verona Band. Every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land and the Muwekma Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and Broader Bay Area community today. I want to say one more thing about this statement before I move on, which is to recognize that a lot of effort went into these words, um, not my own. I adapted them for my own use, but it was the labor of the Muwekma Ohlone people and Native American student development at UC Berkeley. So if these words move you, I encourage you to learn more about the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. Uh, and its efforts to regain federal recognition, uh, to preserve its culture and repatriate its ancestors' remains. Okay, so next I would like to thank uh, Adrienne Roth and her family uh, and her friends, um, and it's their annual donations uh, and their support of the Philip Roth Fund uh, that make this event possible. I'm going to next spend a few moments just reflecting on ERG's year and that's really to set up um, my introduction of Kathy. Um, so what I find most compelling about ERG uh, and what was on full display in this last year is its ability to pursue high impact research and education for a sustainable environment and a just society. In the last year, our students, our alumni, our faculty have made incredible contributions uh, to conversations around energy, environmental and climate justice in the US and Sub-Saharan Africa Latin America and the Indian subcontinent. They've made contributions to safe drinking water in prisons and in low-income communities. They've made contributions to climate and infrastructure decision-making and to carbon markets and management. We've welcomed another wonderful cohort of masters and PhD students from around the world. And we've seen another stellar group of PhD and master's students go on to prestigious academic posts, um, influential science advisor positions, R&D positions, uh, reshaping the energy landscape uh, and to utilities seeking to adapt to climate change. Our capacity to do this is driven in part by the incredible resources that we have at UC Berkeley, uh, in part by the faculty and staff that chart ERG's course, but I think most importantly, um, our faculty, our, we are capable of doing this, uh, if I can find my page, by our students and eventually our alumni that come to learn, work, and play here. Uh, so our alumni in particular have made incredible and selfless contributions in the last year. Um, they began a professional development program for our current students and uh, funded our Big Give event uh, to such a generous amount that we were able to cover four semesters of non-resident tuition for incoming students. So if you are moved uh, to contribute to ERG tonight, I'd welcome you to use the QR code in the program. So you notice that throughout ERG's successes in the last year, I mentioned three pillars. There's research, there's education, and service to society. And I think nobody better embodies those three pillars in our community than Kathy Koshland. So Kathy earned her BA in fine arts from Haverford College. I want to note that I don't typically mention people's credentials based on their selective institutions, but in this case, it's relevant because it's a mark of Kathy's trailblazing in that it was one of her first acts to uh, join and get a degree from an educational institution that was not yet admitting women. So she was one of the first people to graduate from Haverford before the college had even begun admitting women. So after receiving her master's uh, and her PhD from another nearby institution across the bay, I won't mention that one and I won't give her <laughs> hold anything against uh, her for that. But she joined the Berkeley faculty in 1984. And her original appointment was environmental and health sciences uh, in the School of Public Health. 
but with her broad, truly ergy interdisciplinary contributions spanning occupational health, engineering, the fine arts, industrial ecology, she eventually realized that erg was a place where she could have a natural home on campus, and she moved part of her line, and we welcomed her with open arms um, in the mid-90s. At her retirement, she held the Wood Calvert Engineering Chair for her contributions in her field. Kathy also has an extraordinary series of increasingly important leadership roles on this campus. She first served as the chair of the Berkeley Division of the Academic Senate, uh, then as vice provost for academic planning and facilities, vice chancellor for undergraduate education, and eventually our executive vice chancellor and provost. Many buildings rose under her watch. Uh, she was instrumental in expanding Berkeley's digital learning footprint. She advanced our American Cultures program, extension and summer studies, study abroad, research teaching and learning services. Her impact was just extraordinary. Uh, she was a change maker in Berkeley's leadership infrastructure, expanding the role and the influence of the academic enterprise in campus administration. And in the final years of her career, she was instrumental in shepherding Berkeley through the COVID-19 pandemic, always looking for ways to ensure that the voices of students were heard and that decisions were made on their behalf. So as you might not be surprised, her extraordinary contributions earned her Berkeley's highest honor, the Berkeley Citation. Um, and she has been and is a source of tremendous pride and admiration for all of us at ERG. Though we're smaller than her other affiliate departments, um, we know that she's always actually been at the core of her heart in Ergi. And so I'm greatly honored to present Kathy Koshlin to give our annual lecture this year. Well, thank you all. It's really a, a pleasure to be here, and um, I'm honored and, and delighted to be um, among many of the previous um, annual lecturer givers. I know John Hart, Dick Norgard, if I've missed anybody, um, really feel like I'm in very exalted um, territory. So thank you for this opportunity. I'm going to spend the day, the, this evening, you know, reflecting on a number of things, that the challenges of the modern eras of the 20th and 21st century are vast and complex. And to understand them and address them requires multiple approaches, skill sets, and perspectives. Hence, the development of interdisciplinary strategies. This talk will reflect on the history of Berkeley and ERG's efforts in this regard. Um, what are the elements that made this campus a fertile ground for pioneering collaborative and interdisciplinary research? And I'll highlight my own journey in this way, um, reflecting on the students with whom I've worked and um, then reflect on our institutional strategies uh, that allow us to capitalize on our capabilities and lessons learned along the way. And I would say we are still in the process of learning how to do this. So why, when, and how to engage in interdisciplinary research, education, and public service? And I will say that this talk would be three hours if I actually talked about education and service. So I'm mostly fo focused on research, but not to say that these other two pillars aren't critical to, to what we do. So one reason to engage on a personal level is to broaden one's own and strengthen one's own research through collaboration. So my first ERG PhD student was Kevin Kennedy, who got his PhD in 1996. He approached me because I was working on a super fun project where we were looking at incineration of hazardous waste, whether that was a good idea or not. Um, and he was interested in how to understand the challenges that um, folks who wanted to do to, to implement these facilities were having in finding communities that would accept it. And he did an interesting four case study comparison of economic and communication models, the theory out there being that if you either improved one's understanding of the technical characteristics um, or were able to negotiate the right kind of economic um, package that you could actually successfully site these facilities. Well, the reality was the theories are flawed. They failed to understand the role that communities actually needed to play. And they failed to understand the fact that you actually had to think not just about that immediate community, but was the policy, was the encouragement 
to build these facilities the right strategy for managing hazardous waste. And in the end, it wasn't. And what's interesting is in the process, the arc of time in which these facilities were uh, when attempted to site them, the whole need to create them went away because companies figured out better ways to reduce the production of hazardous waste. There were better ways to manage it. So it's an interesting issue about what are you really trying to tackle in these problems and when do you pull back and ask a different set of questions than the ones that were initially asked in this area. This was really, it was, it was a really important lesson for me early about the role of communities and how to interact and, and work with them um, in, in any kind of situation. Um, I'll just say an aside, one of my projects that wasn't an, an ERG PhD, but was with Susan Fisher in Environmental Health Sciences um, in the School of Public Health, was an integrated assessment that really built on what we learned from the work with Kevin. On, and the, the bottom line in this work in China was how not to do a development project. Um, and it's quite an interesting story, which I won't go into tonight, but if anybody's interested at some point, I'd you know, love to share what I learned in that process of trying to understand what happens when the UN development program comes in and tries to implement something without, again, paying attention to what communities actually need, who's in charge, those kinds of things. So a second reason to do interdisciplinary work is to, to address a problem you can't solve without a diverse team. Um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate um, Change, of course, um, our own Dan Kamen and others in this room were involved in the early phases of this. Um, so, have been engaged subsequently, the work of that panel could not happen without multiple perspectives, multiple disciplines, and the presence of people who could synthesize and bring all the threads together. It's, it's not enough to just have the multiple disciplines. You've got to have people who can integrate and understand that, and that is a quintessential ERG characteristic. Um, I am going to come back and talk a little bit about the MTBE story in a few slides from now, but just to say that that was a, a mini version of how to solve a problem with multiple entities, and then you know, cracking the human um, genome was another huge multidisciplinary project that many Berkeley faculty were involved in. Another reason is to engage in interdisciplinary work is when you have a particular tool or method that becomes useful across disciplines. And this requires then an ability um, to go out and explain the power, say, of a particular algorithm or, or a, the advanced light source at LVNL. You need to understand what its capability is, communicate that, and then invite researchers from many different disciplines to come and take advantage of that particular approach or discipline. It's a different way of thinking about interdisciplinarity, but it's a really essential part of what we do. And it's certainly something, I'm looking at Jennifer here, you know, that the, the CDSS will hopefully be able to be an anchor for a lot of that on this campus in terms of, of data science. And finally, it's really important as an academic institution to think about who, what constitutes our faculty and, and how to have strategies to bring um, new research questions into academe. What are those perspectives? Who needs to be at the table? Who needs to be teaching our students? And how to go about doing that? And particularly as a public institution, it's also the way in which we carry out our mission of public service. So what makes Berkeley, what made Berkeley such a fertile ground for success for interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary efforts? Now let's look at a few of them. In the 1970s, we had some incredible faculty leadership and shared governance coming from the Senate, but faculty leadership in terms of chancellor and, and, um, and provost. There were ample resources from the state. 70% of our revenue came from the state of California, as opposed to the 13 to 15% today. There's a lot to be said about that. Um, we had a strong liberal arts core, and I'm gonna come back to that because I really think we need to push hard to ensure that especially our undergraduates aren't just swept up into computer science or data science without a strong, broad understanding. Most ERGIs come e either come in with that, or one of the reasons they pick ERG is that they've been in a more narrow discipline and they want to expand what they're thinking about. So it, that when I say a liberal arts core, I think it's fundamental to how we really can advance various ideas um, in, in intellectually. The professional schools at Berkeley were tasked with doing research as well as education and training of, of largely um, master's level students. So that element was also important because the professions um, were able to engage in that same kind of, of research conversation. We've had organized research units on this campus. When I looked at the 
um, archives, it turns out the very first organized research unit predates the university. It's the um, University Herbarium, which was founded in, in 1860. Um, and then subsequently the next one is the, uh, I love this, the Seismographic Stations, founded in 1887. I thought that was really cool that we actually had that as one of our first ORUs. Um, another ingredient that was alive and well in the 70s was our partnership with the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, which was even more integrated, I think, with the campus at that time than perhaps it is today. And we also had the graduate group structure. That actually existed. There are graduate groups that well predate ERG um, on this campus. So we had a way in which you could bring faculty from disparate disciplines together um, to create a graduate program. I also want to emphasize, when I came here in 1984, one of the things that absolutely struck me was what I call the porosity of this campus, the ability of faculty and students to move across the campus to teach. I taught in engineering as well as public health, being able to be an affiliate at ERG. There were so many things that I could do that I never felt I could do as a graduate student at that other institution. Um, and, and that our Berkeley students really are encouraged to, to be out there. We have structures like, I, I will say, at many institutions, you have one PhD advisor. There's one person who signs your dissertation, not at least three, not someone from outside of your program. That in itself forces a certain kind of, of reaching out across the campus. Our qualifying exam requires two outside fields, you need faculty from those. You take courses across the campus. There's a way, again, in which that structure at the graduate level really encourages that kind of thing. And at our undergraduate level, of course, we have breadth requirements. But even majors in the College of Letters and Science, most of them require at least one or two courses outside of the department in which you are majoring. So again, that, that, that structure that supports crossing disciplines, learning about other perspectives, is, is really critical. Um, so, ERG. Conversation started in 1969 with Ned Birdsall um, and many other um, faculty around questions around energy, energy sources, energy approaches. What were we doing? This really, in some ways, predates the energy crisis, which sort of blooms in about 1973. Um, so they were prescient in terms of the conversations that were beginning. Um, Dick Norgard was a junior faculty member in 1970 and got invited to this conversation. So critical to include our junior faculty in thinking about these problems and, and the future that it involves. Um, it was a process of shared learning. Um, the conversations, the weekly conversations, were ones in which questions were encouraged, all perspectives were, were welcome. Um, there was a real sense of learning together that um, became a part of this weekly uh, endeavor. And over time, that group decided that what they were doing was really worth thinking about how to actually educate students to engage in that same kind of, of discursive um, interaction. And the idea to form a graduate group began. Um, they were, and I will just say that, that the idea was both to keep the faculty engaged, because great to have graduate students because then you really do stay engaged, and, and also the, the idea of developing a new kind of professional, which didn't exist anywhere, um, and, and that ERGIs eventually um, become. The energy crisis provided a focus, and then the whole part of resources actually was added as, as people began to realize that energy wasn't the only thing that we should be worrying about. Ingredients for success for ERG. Um, was first this engaged faculty um, from all ranks, committed to this broader um, set of issues, the big picture, a willingness to listen to each other. There was a senior administrative support. The EVCP at the time, or the equivalent of the provost at the time, um, was extremely supportive of, of this effort. It didn't hurt that he was also part of the conversation. Um, <laughs> it's more Christensen. Um, but it, it meant you had support at the highest level, uh, as well as, as this very strong um, grassroots effort from, from faculty. Um, there was effective leadership initially from Ned and others, but then also um, when John Holdren um, joined the, the group, he proved, you know, was just a natural leader and able to do a lot um, for this program that perhaps we hadn't even anticipated when, when he was hired. Um, I will say 
that the again the energy crisis provided a focus which accelerated the approval of the programs because at all levels we had to go all the way up through you know the office of the president to get approval for a new um, graduate group graduate program um, and and that went in incredibly fast um, it's always nice to have things happen fast on this campus it doesn't always happen um, one of the other things was that ERG's bylaws and, and approach meant there was an effective affiliate faculty structure. Um, for most of the first 30 or so years of ERG, um, our, our uh, chair was always from an affiliate. It was not a member of the core faculty. Um, the core faculty be, you know, joined John Hart, um, Gene Rockland, and Tony Fisher, and eventually Tony went to a department, and um, um, Dick Norgard joined us um, as part of the core. And then, of course, we were supported by longstanding relationships with LBNL and and also also the, the Lawrence Livermore Lab. Um, today, you can see the numbers, 10 core faculty from the original four. That's a great success um, for us. Um, wonderful new um, junior faculty colleagues. Um, roughly the same number of graduate students we've had for a long time, about an equal mix between masters and PhD. Um, 600 alumni who are in amazing positions of leadership across the nation. And, and the globe for that matter, and then a, a number of affiliates that's upwards around 158. So I want to illustrate the power of ERG with another um, vignette of one of my doctoral students. This is Pamela Franklin, who got her PhD in the late 90s. Um, talk a little bit about the story of MTBE, methyl tertiary butyl ether. It's an oxygenate, you can see the oxygen. Um, Adam up there. Um, the theory being uh, that if a molecule like that carries its own oxygen, it will burn more efficiently because it already has the, what it needs to um, be combusted. Um, and it was part of the, the plan in the, at locally at EPA to um, reformulate gasoline so it would be less volatile, more um, efficiently combusted, have fewer um, carcinogens like less benzene, less toluene in, in its composition. Um, and it was really an important breakthrough because it was something that would make, would reduce air pollution, particulates, and a lot of things without having to, to tweak with the engine. You just were modifying the fuel. And you could do that a lot faster and a lot more quickly and a lot less resistance to that. Um, so that was part of the strategy of reformulated gasoline. The issue was that no one realized how water, well, that's not true. None of the air people or the energy people realized how soluble meth MTBE was in water. And the crisis ensued when wells in Santa Monica, a reservoir, and Lake Tahoe all got contaminated with MTBE. Um, it was an additive in gasoline. It was being used now in this, in this effort to create a, a more effective um, combustion. Um, but it had this deleterious aspect of making potable water, smell terrible, and taste awful. Now, for a lot of folks, it was like, well, it's not a carcinogen, or it probably isn't, or maybe we don't know, and it doesn't seem to be a neurotoxin, and the science of, you know, it sort of toxic health effects wasn't well established. But we're in an arid state. We can't afford to have any of our water get contaminated for whatever reasons. So UC was tasked with presenting an argument to the state about whether we should keep or get rid of MTBE. And Pamela did a lot of the combustion work, demonstrating aspects of, of MTBE that weren't known at the time. Um, a number of other colleagues at Davis, Santa Barbara, and um, UCLA were engaged in the health effects work, the water quality work, the policy work around this. There were huge economic implications because the um, refineries had spent about $6 billion to create the, the, the means to make MTBE. Um, so you had a huge economic um, incentive. They had these byproducts that you could make MTBE from pretty cheaply. So they were not thrilled with um, our work. Um, and on top of it uh, were the fact that, in fact, the water people at the federal EPA actually knew that MTBE was a contaminant and had contaminated water in Maine and other areas. But those two siloed agencies within EPA did not talk to each other. So the air people had no clue. Um, so all this unfolds. There's some memorable stories about going in front of, of California EPA with our results. Pam presented um, to that 
august body um the then czar for for e california epa asked everybody just you know click when they were happy and no no cat calls or anything and there were some real characters in the room it was quite a scene um the end result was mtbe was banned in california um, and that was a collaborative effort um, across the campus. It was a, an eye-opener for me around, again, policy, the siloing. So not only is interdisciplinary work needed in academia, it's needed in government, it's needed in other places because the siloing had this communication happened um, more appropriately at EPA, MTB probably would not have been allowed as part of the reformulated gasoline um, array and there are other options like ethanol that can be used to achieve the same thing. So just a little example of, of, of an ERGI having a real impact um, in the state of California. Um, so let's talk a little bit about campus efforts in interdisciplinary, I'm gonna focus a little bit on environmental, but I'm gonna talk a little bit more broadly about research post ERGS establishment. So ERG gets established as a graduate group in, in, well, John gets hired in 1973, the first students are 1975, that's when we'll celebrate our 50th. 50th, yes, anniversary in 2025. That's, we've all settled on that date. There's been lots of debate about what year, but 2025. Um, so I wanna give you two examples of things that happened in the 70s and 80s that were again um, pretty impactful for the faculty involved. One was the creation of the Townsend Center for the Humanities in 1987, which for the first time really created a forum for faculty in the humanities and in the humanistic social sciences to come together in working groups, um, to, to have opportunities for conversation. Um, it's a really important center um, in, in the life of the campus for that. And um, all kinds of interesting things have come out of the work of the Townsend Center on behalf of, of our colleagues in the, in, and graduate students in the humanistic so, humanities and social sciences. I had the chance to be um, a Townsend Center Fellow in 2003 when I was Chair of the Senate, and that was just a wonderful opportunity to get to know faculty in the, that part of the campus and to participate in, in weekly dis discussions about our work. The other major um, really interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary effort was biology reorganization at Berkeley, and that happened um, beginning in the late 70s, um, culminating in, in the early 80s in terms of the actual organization plan, and then subsequently there were buildings built and, and labs improved. Um, this was really driven by the revolution in the biological sciences, which was reshaping the landscape for um, folks in, in biology, and we had 19 to 20 departments of biology on this campus. And they were scattered all over the place. They were in six colleges and schools, um, about 250 faculty. And so corralling that, coming up with an effective organization, and in the end, created molecular and cell biology as one department, integrated biology as a second, um, environmental science policy and management as a third, and plant and microbial biology as the fourth department. So those are the four mega departments that, that reduced the number of, and created actually way better conditions for graduate students because they didn't have to make a decision in say MCB between being an immunologist or a neuroscientist. At the time they could come in and explore same kind of thing we have that ergies get to do. Anyway, it, was, it really created a different landscape for our graduate students and our ability to attract really superb graduate students skyrocketed, as well as our ability to, to do much, much better um, science in the biologies. So again, the kind of, of fertile ground that Berkeley had, um, the kind of leadership that was in existence there you know, made a big difference. So based on that, some of us, John was one of them, John Hart, we created the Environmental Working Group and thought, okay, if you could do it with 250 faculty in, in biology, what could we maybe begin to do in the environmental sciences, um, environmental studies writ large across this campus? So it was an effort to coordinate and leverage our, our capacity in this area. We have about 250 faculty. We modeled, um, eventually it proposed to the provost and got approved, the Environmental Council modeled it on the Chancellor's Advisory Committee on Biology. But we weren't as successful in this as, as I think many of us had hoped. Um, there were oppositions from the deans to our influence in the council on, on FTE selections. Um, in some ways, there was a lack of clear focus. We had way too many irons in the fire in a variety of ways. We didn't have something like the revolution in biology to, to bring us together, or they hoped that climate change. But again, we were almost, pre we were speaking in the wilderness at the time, because not lots of people outside of 
Fergies were paying attention to climate change um, in, in the 1990s. There was also a lack of resources. Remember, we went through a crisis in the early 90s where we lost 25% of the Berkeley faculty. They took the early retirement program. We rebuilt the faculty up to what was then 85%. So we had a lot of infusion of wonderful young faculty in the mid-90s, but we were also growing. This can't, the number of students was much larger. So you had this, this sort of perfect storm of great new energy ideas coming in, but fewer resources coming from the state of California. And by that time, I think we were down to maybe 50% of our revenue coming from the state. Um, but still, it meant that, that there were competing interests. And on top of it, there was no real administrative champion for what we were trying to do. Um, So, fast forward, um, other campus initiatives. We kind of rethought some things. In the early 2000s, um, the state came forward, and um, I'm gonna go through briefly all of these, so we'll, we'll move on to the new initiatives um, strategy. There was a hope of 120 new faculty lines, um, and the state had promised monies, it looked like it was going to be good, and of course what happens, you get the dot-com bubble bust, um, and the promises go away, but we got about 60 new FTE, and the Senate, many of us felt that it was really important to make an investment that wasn't just the budget committee saying, okay, one more person in English, one more person in mechanical engineering, one more person in art history, whatever, that we needed to not just have growth in that incremental way that we needed to invest in the future in a very different way. So we had this, we had a strategic planning process. We came up with 10 areas of potential investment. We had a competition. Um, we entertained one proposal per area, which meant the faculty had to work together to, to do that. Um, and we came up with these five were the winners in a sense. Four of them got faculty lines. One didn't. Environment did not. We had 250 faculty. <laughs> it was it was critical area, but it was hard for the administration to justify allocating resources in 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 this area. Um, computational biology actually became an augmented graduate group. It offers a PhD. Um, it's a very successful um, program. It's a good example of one of the reasons we made this investment. Every biology department was listing as possible FTE positions somebody in computational biology. No one was putting it first, or second, or third. It was usually fourth or fifth on the list. And yet, you could see this was the future. It was really important. And so by making this kind of an investment and saying, okay, we're going to make an opportunity, meant you had, and then now it's, I, you know, if you ask our dean in biology, he'll say he can't recruit certain people unless they know that they can be part of the computational biology group. So it was, a really important step and a, and a different kind of strategy to, to change the landscape for Berkeley. And you could say the same thing about um, GMS, which has faculty in political science, environmental design, and civil engineering. The Center for New Media is a, alive and well with some of the most amazing intersections of art, technology, culture, science, um, digital resources. Um, GMS, Center for New Media, um, and nanoscience all offer designated emphases. Computational biology is the one that actually now has a PhD as well as a designated emphasis. Um, and for those of you who don't know, designated emphases are effectively minors for PhD students. And I'll talk a little bit more about them in, in a few minutes. Following on that was an aha moment that our strategic plan in the early 2000s completely neglected areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so led by many people in the Senate, was an effort to, uh, again, address a changed landscape for faculty and came up with this idea of this Berkeley Diversity Research Initiative, which was to identify areas like disability studies or diversity and health disparities where there were likely to be individuals who themselves might reflect that um, and who could bring a changed conversation to the table. And so uh, we had a generous gift from um, the Haas Jr. Fund that allowed us, us to establish um, seven faculty chairs um, and um, recruit both new faculty as well as rewarding some faculty on the campus who were already engaged in this kind of work. So again, there were issues both with the, the strategic initiatives, issues with this in terms of where faculty sat, how you evaluated them. We've learned a lot about how to sort of go about this. 
um, in, in that time frame. More recently, our, our strategic plan on the campus um, identified um, five areas for investment um, through the um, current capital campaign as well as, as the strategy under, under Carol's leadership. Notice that again, once again, environment, climate, and, and energy is one of the areas that we say is really crucial. Um, I will give our esteemed dean um, uh, credit for really working on this particular uh, initiative um, in it for the for energy and climate environment. Um, all these five initiatives have garnered some resources, some faculty lines. Um, we have a long way to go still in realizing the the hope for for this future, but. It, really important to to continue to push in this area. Um, so another another way in which we're trying to change the conversation. And I would say coming out of all these things has been finally something I've advocated for for a long time, which was to make cluster hires, to bring in a cohort of junior faculty, possibly with a with with one senior faculty, um, in these areas where we feel there's a really a value. And why do that? All the other things we had done were like one-offs, like an incremental, this person all alone in a department trying to change the conversation. That was true for the Berkeley Diversity Research Initiative. By bringing in a cohort of faculty, they get to know each other. Um, I think we figured out we need to provide a little bit of resources so that there's some glue that can hold them together. Um, but I think we're making progress in this area and I'm delighted to see um, our, our efforts in this and the climate equity and environmental justice one has been um, very successful. I think we have everybody in that. Yeah, thanks Meg. Yeah, um, including some people in this room. Um, so it, I, again, we learned a lot in the last you know 20 years about, about how to go about um, changing the professoriate, changing the conversations, and then making our work um, more meaningful to um, our graduate students, our undergraduates, and our overall mission. Just a few words to say here about, about um, the structures that support interdisciplinary faculty and graduate student research. These are really critical. Um, I mentioned earlier this uh, interdisciplinary degrees and the role of designated emphases. And we have, an, I think there are 20 or 25 on the campus today. And huge numbers of doctoral students take advantage of emphases that in, in other institutions, you don't have this option. You, you can't, you, you, you know, you might be, uh, I don't know, in, in, in art history, you can go and get a designated emphasis in women and gender and, and sexuality, or you could be an ergy and get a designated emphasis in this area. You could be in engineering and think about, about human-centered design and choose to have a, a designated emphasis in this area. So these, these, the opportunity to have a, PH, a minor within your PhD, this is in some cases outside of your field. This is in addition to, it might be, um, that you can do this. And I think that's another, another area in which ERG, or, or the Berkeley campus has led the way in terms of making um, this kind of, of experience uh, available. And as you can see, um, there are a number of, of these. As I said, there's over 20 on the campus today. Another form of support is this augmented graduate group. Um, some of us are, are more champions of, of this effort than others. Um, ERG being, of course, the quintessential example, although computational biology certainly is one. And neuroscience actually began as a graduate group within the Helen Wills Institute. They are now on their way to becoming a department. It may have actually been established. I'm not sure. I've lost track of the timeline. Not being provost anymore, I don't have to pay attention to that. Um, <laughs> but the, the point being is that the, the, these augmented graduate groups provide a particular framework. I will say the, the reason there's opposition is not about the graduate group. It's about our capacity to have our faculty teach undergraduates. And so augmented graduate groups that will engage and teach undergraduates will gain more support and ERG push, you know, punches well above its weight um, in terms of service to undergraduates as well. So that, that's something that, that um, is important to the provost um, and um, you know, important to the campus as a whole. Organized research units support us. This is a little bit of a, I find this a, a challenge. Um, ORUs provided a structure. Um, as I said, the first ones were in the late um, 1800s. Um, 
Berkeley's blessed with seven research museums. Some of you have worked with our collections in the Natural History Museum and Paleontology. Climate science is benefiting enormously from what we know um, from our specimens and other things that are that are in in uh, Valley Life Sciences and the in the museums there. Um, our natural reserve sites are are amazing resource throughout the state of California. Um, and we have over 50 multidisciplinary institutes and centers on the campus. Um, the reason I say it's, it's, it's an issue is that some of them maybe have lasted beyond their shelf life, um, and killing them or getting rid of them is incredibly challenging. Uh, when Beth Burnside tried to do this in the early 2000s, um, had a big, long, you know, lots of review, we didn't eliminate any and added two. So <laughs> classic Berkeley in some ways. Um, you know, I think there's a place for consolidation. I think we need to think um, seriously about what they're actually providing. And one of the real challenges we have today is that these used to be well-resourced. These used to be ways in which faculty could get support for writing their grants, um, for managing their grants. Um, as resources dwindled from the state, this is where a lot of the budget cuts took place. And I would argue that while we also talk about the state not investing in undergraduate education, which they don't, they pay less than half of what it costs us, um, they really have neglected us in terms of research. And, and that goes to our physical infrastructure as well as the capacity to actually carry out what we do. Um, and that's frustrating since we are supposed to be the research arm for the state. Um, another asset that really helps support us is the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. I think this is an area where we need to re-engage more deeply with the lab. Um, we currently have about 200 faculty involved um, and probably six or 700 graduate students. Um, but it's an area where I actually think um, the numbers were higher at some point um, in terms of the numbers and faculty engaged. And again, I think a lot of this has to do with um, faculty time, and I'll come to that in a minute. One of the real shining bright lights is our engagement with um, UC San Francisco, which has been a tense and fraught relationship up until maybe the last seven or eight years, with a few exceptions. The joint medical program with public health has ebbed and flowed. It's now on a very good footing with them. This is a program where students get a master's degree and then spend their first two years of medical school here, and then they go and get their second two years at UCSF. It's a smooth path there. It's actually an amazing program um, that has helped diversify a small fraction of, of the physicians um, that come through. Um, you can see the other things that we're doing. The most recent and amazing one is computational precision health. Amazing for a couple reasons. One, um, funded generously by a donor. Two, got approval in absolutely record time. Maybe we'll beat ERG in terms of the approval timeline um, for it. And has brought, and is a, a, our faculty are shared. So the graduate group crosses the two institutions, but it's also that our faculty cross the two institutions. They have joint appointments in both uh, in both campuses, and we'll see how that goes. But um, another example of our willingness to try something different and um, make it happen. And Jennifer's had a big hand in, in helping make that happen. Um, pretty exciting. Um, so lots of ways in which we, we can engage across interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary ways. But our continuing challenge, um, especially in environmental research, is um, you know, organizational challenges, no successful coordinating effort to date. Our efforts in the Berkeley Environmental Institute um, sort of never panned out for a number of reasons. Um, we have had increasingly effective philanthropy and grants, but nothing as major as, say what Harvard just got, a modest grant gift out of the blue of $200 million in this broad area. Why don't they think of Berkeley? Why Harvard? Um, I will say there is campus-wide recognition, as you see from the strategic plan, of the importance of this work. There's a deep academic bench across the schools and colleges in terms of the faculty. Um, there are real openness to innovation and, and creativity, and again, exceptional graduate students coming to us in a variety of areas, ERG being um, the shining light, but in many, many other parts of the campus and in the rest of CNR and engineering, um, public health. So let me just conclude with a couple of, of reflections and one more vignette um, from one of my graduate students. Erg was a bold experiment. 50 years later, what does the future hold? Risks. 
Lack of faculty time may limit affiliate engagement. We just talked about that in core faculty meeting yesterday. Um, new funding models may affect our student initiative. One of the things that has been a hallmark for ERG, but in other areas, is students being really proactive in going out and, and getting grants and, and um, competing nationally for, for, for support. We could have lots of conversations about the pros and cons of, of that situation. I will say, as someone whose PhD advisor protected her from having to write a grant or look for funding, um, I got here as an assistant professor having not a clue how to write a grant, having never done it. I don't ever want to see a doctoral student again in that situation. So, you know, there's, there's, there's straight, there's up and downs about, about how to think about, about that element. Um, I think there's an overemphasis, no offense, Jennifer, on computer science and data science skills among our undergraduates. Again, a need for a much broader um, education, and, and I worry about, again, the, the next generation coming up um, not having a, a better set of skills more broadly in the liberal arts. I know some of our, our own ERG students, and I, I can understand this, sac feel that we might be sacrificing depth for breadth in our education, so it's something I think we will be beginning to have discussions about and think about how we, how we are going to go about the next phase of, of curriculum for, for our graduate students. What are our assets? That shared learning community among or is alive and well. The PhD seminar still to me is the heart and soul of, of the experience. The master seminar for master students providing the same kind of thing. Um, that shared learning is so critical and participating in that is, is something that um, is critical. I've certainly enjoyed um, being there this year. Um, the porosity across disciplines, the encouragement of our students to explore and, and try different things. Um, the flexibility to ask questions and pursue questions not asked by others and get support and encouragement to do that. Um, amazing applicants. Um, an impactful alumni community that is really engaged and, and giving back in many ways. And then our scholar activist culture that affects both faculty and, and our graduate students. So lots of assets, definitely some risks. So let me talk a little bit about my last PhD student, Anusha, who's here. Um, and, and why ERG and interdisciplinary work matter in a very different way. Anusha um, started out looking at, at issues around water, water quality, then moved into access on the internet, and eventually landed on um, the question of who gets to have the say in building the multilingual internet. So why is this an energy and resources problem? Well, it's a resource problem. It's an access problem. You're asking the same questions about this resource, these digital resources, that you ask about water, that you ask about energy, um, that you ask about other kinds of things. You ask, who, who's making the rules? What's the role of the local community? Who's engaged in the work? What's the role of government? What's the role of, of, of the software industry in this case? Um, what role do global actors play on something that may affect a local community? And this case was, is, is revelatory about the whole development of the internet, but in particular, there's this character, the Bangla letter Kandata, many of you have heard this story, but the point is, it wasn't encoded initially, and it created all kinds of issues um, within the Bangla community, um, as people began to try to develop keyboards and uh, I don't know all the lingo <laughs> that Anusha knows, but you know, just creating the way in which a, a, a computer would, would encode a, a non-Western script um, and how to have it work. And there were very rigid standards set by Unicode that created for about five years a lot of back and forth and concern about, well, if, if we allow this character to happen, Somehow we're violating the, the rules by which we've learned to live. Um, so it's, it's an amazing story. I can't wait for Anusha's book to come out um, one of these days, I hope, um, with this history about South Asian um, identity and politics. And the reason I, 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 I actually, it's been a joy to, to, to work with Anusha and, and, and Isha on, on, on this project. And, you know, her work like many ERG, ERG students, draws on any number of disciplines. South Asian history, sociolinguistics, histories of computing and typography, 
data mining. Uh, Anusha worked a lot, and D-Lab has helped lots of faculty figure out how to, how to use data in their work. Um, interviews with key players um, that she conducted. Um, just a, a wide variety, both of methods, approaches, data resources, um, and, and, and disciplines to come together to create um, and tell a story that's actually really um, important when you think about sort of global dynamics around the use of digital resources. So I have a little bit of institutional advice. That's a few, at least one dean here. Um, <laughs> and, and one former chair, ah, oh, two deans, <laughs> three deans, um, <laughs> dean and vice provost. Um, one is, in any kind of thing where you're trying to accomplish something, lead with faculty ideas and strengths. It is not something that can be imposed from the top down. And at Berkeley, that particularly doesn't work. Um, so important to include junior faculty in the conversations. Don't shield them from the really fun stuff, which is like thinking about the future and what's going to happen. Um, you can shield them from other kinds of administrative things, but don't shield them from, from, from these kinds of endeavors. Open competitions can help identify the best ideas. Engaged senior leadership really matters, and that doesn't mean it's our idea. It's we're there to support the best ideas that come from our faculty, and, and that's a really crucial element of how to go about making things happen, particularly on this campus, but I think it happens um, in many, many situations. Invest in a manageable set of initiatives. You know, every decade you can kind of play around, but give, give time for things to, to come to fruition. Um, don't go chasing the next bright, shiny object. Um, you gotta have a little bit of staying power and discipline in this. Um, be flexible about the structure for an initiative. Don't assume that what you did before is what you should do next. Um, don't assume that because something failed 20 years ago doesn't mean it might actually be time and might be ripe. So there's a place of, of reflection on thinking about, well, what, what did we abandon that might actually work now? And be clear on the goals, but recognize that each effort effort will evolve organically um, over time and that some of that is out of your control if you're an administrator um, and and it's important to sort of let that happen as it as it will as again the next generation for the institution comes in and and has its say so with that I just want to acknowledge um, a few folks um, the late Bob Sawyer and Jean Rockland who were incredibly important in in my life as a faculty member and even before I was a faculty member in the case of Bob Sawyer um, recognize uh, John Holdren Richard Norgard and John Hart all the current ERG core faculty all my ERG PhD and master students I co-taught with Jean the master seminar for a long time in the 90s um, love that um, the extended ERG community I also want to recognize Paul Gray, who was my first provost, Bill Webster, who tutored me in a lot of things, Marion Koshland, who was a mentor and guide, um, Bob Spear in public health. The EVCT P EVCP team in particular, Chris Yetter, who helped with the very original version of this talk a year ago. And then thank you for the opportunity to serve this campus. <laughs> I retired last July, so it's been. <laughs> but, but what are your plans next? I guess that's my question. Um, you know, I'm. I've had a great time this year, being reconnecting with with Erg in particular. It's been just a, a, a joy to to do that. Um, my husband, who's here, and I, you know, travel plans over the next few years as we have the the both the time and the energy to um, engage in more rigorous activities than than we might have. And we delayed a number of trips and things um, until now. We have eight grandchildren; they're all in the Bay Area. It's a kick to spend time with with all of them. And then I'm, you know, I'm a, a resource as far as I'm concerned for the campus. Anytime somebody, you know, wants a conversation. Um, I'm available, and, and, and actually that's what I love being able to do is support my colleagues um, uh, across the campus. So that's, that's what we're doing right now. And you know, I'm trying to do some, some drawing and painting. I actually took a drawing class um, from the ASUCR Art Studio in the fall. 
that was a kick. Um, <laughs> and, um, so yeah, keep him busy. Not writing any more grants. So other questions, David. So one, so one simple theory would be that the, the, the core is disciplinary and only in times of expanding resources can we go interdisciplinary and in the times of shrinking resources, that's what gets trimmed off. And I say it's simple because I know it's not adequate, but my question is, what's the alternative? <laughs> so in what, in, what way does inter, in what way can interdisciplinarity not only survive budget austerity, but be a vehicle for success or, you know, reinvention um, during such moments as we are in now? That's a really good question, David, and a really tough one, I think. Um, what I would say is that, you know, ERGA survived the ebbs and flows over the last almost 50 years of exactly that. And I think part of it is a willingness to commit to that kind of work and, you know, convincing colleagues in some of the disciplines that they can take a risk with a member of their community who might choose to think a little bit outside of the box. Um, I think our cluster hire strategy is a really good one if we can provide at least a little bit of resource to, to help those faculty stay connected to each other and not get completely consumed by their respective departments. Um, including them when there's a, you know, when the state makes a call for a problem to make sure that, I, I was blessed by the fact that, that when the Prop 65 came out and there was a campus-wide effort to think about that proposition and the toxic substances acts associated with it. And I got included as an assistant professor by the dean of the College of Chemistry. And that was powerful. I got to know colleagues across the campus, senior people. Um, it was important for my own career um, to, to have those contacts and understand things. So, you know, again, I, I think taking advantage of moments when we can, um, even in times of austerity, um, are, are important to making that happen. Um, I don't know if that's a great answer, but I, I, I think it, it's so much of the future is going to depend on both being able to do that interdisciplinary synthesis, that problem solving, that collective collaborative work and it's not to say that the disciplines aren't important. They're, they're critical. But so is the interdisciplinary work. And I think we have to just keep that front and center. Jennifer. Hi, Kathy. Um, you know, I have not been in a room with Ergies. Um, my exposure to ergies has been to some extent through Kathy's stories of erg, uh, which just sounds like an amazing place. And I'm looking at all of you, and I'm thinking, you're very lucky to have Kathy, and Kathy's very lucky to have found erg. Mm -hmm. uh, Kathy is one of the people I have turned to in my three years here. Uh, you know, I, um, I uh, came here wanting to do some interdisciplinary work on a large scale, uh, and Kathy has been always optimistic and open and bringing me back to realistic places <laughs> as well and telling me things I want to hear and telling me things I don't want to hear. <laughs> uh, and I really love that about you, Kathy. Uh, I wonder, um, I, I worry sometimes that uh, as one tries to create more for what I think of as the spaces in between, which get occupied by ERG and other interdisciplinary endeavors, uh, there is a feeling that there is a fixed pie, that there is a zero-sum game. 
Uh, and in fact, as you said, during your time here, the state funding has gone from 70 to 13%. So as Ben Hermelin points out to me, it actually may be a shrinking pie that we're trying to divide. Uh, I, I wonder, um, I have this belief that as we do those um, other things, we manage to grow the resource pie. And I wonder, and I think you've been effective at doing that, and I wonder uh, how you and ERG um, convince your colleagues sometimes that um, the, the pie will grow, that ERG will not take away, but that ERG will find ways to increase the pie and enrich the campus at large. That's an interesting um, perspective, an interesting idea, because I think one of the things that made ERG so effective early on was that affiliates looked to ERG for certain kinds of students and really wanted those students to come and work in their labs or work on their projects. And one of the things that has worried me has been that our faculty was roughly, when ERG was formed, I don't know, Dick, if you remember, were we 1,500? Fa when, we, when we went through the, the, uh, the reduction in the faculty in the early 90s, we were 1,500 faculty. And we grew back, or a little more than that, and then grew back to about 1,500. So the number of faculty has not at all kept pace with the numbers of our students. And I think that is the biggest that's my biggest concern, is that we, that we really don't have the horsepower that we would like to have to really be able to do all the work. And we, we I mean, Berkeley is amazing in, in that it keeps on trucking. Every crisis, we just kind of, okay, here we go. We're going to manage. And somehow we do. But, I, you know, again, one worries about are we, are we really going to be able to sustain that? And, uh, you know, it, it's... it's continue to be creative about our, you know, how, what revenues we bring in, how we um, manage to do what we're doing, um, can we be more creative in, in ways in which we deliver education, I'm going to be started on that, but I mean, it's an interesting question to, to, to grapple with, um, and still provide, particularly at the graduate level, the kind of, of you know, spirited interaction, the kind of, of collaborative work in our, in our labs, in our you know, at ERG, but I'm thinking of the campus writ large. You know, that's so vital to what we do and, and to be able to sustain that and, and eventually grow it. Um, you know, I, I again, I, I continue to get mystified as to why folks don't see us as a place worthy of investment at the scale that Stanford and Harvard get. It... it it doesn't make sense to me, frankly. And I'm a product of a Stanford master's and PhD. Um, grateful for the education I got, but. Don't you feel that, I mean, when you speak about it, I think people would want to give money and increase the numbers. <laughs> no, I really do. I really, really do. So I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm just convinced that we haven't tried as much as we can yet. I don't know. <laughs> don't tell Julie that. But <laughs> yeah. any other? Kathy. Go, oh, Ron. Hi. So uh, I, I wonder if you could comment on the, the ebb and flow between institutional forms for interdisciplinary work and faculty just doing it from wherever they happen to sit. And, and what, how we think about, you know, when is it right to create an institutional form like ERG, and when is it right to just, you know, and you know, right might be the wrong word, but just how do you think about sort of us maintaining that balance over time between interdisciplinary things that grow organically and sit in departments between people who like to work together and, and creating an institutional form that sustains something for 50 years? I think that's a great question because I think the, the, the driver from my perspective in creating an entity really is around graduate education. And that it's worth it to create an entity if what you realized is that there's a place for a new type of education, a new graduate degree like, like ERG. And that that's probably the most powerful driver and the best way in which to, to do this. 
Um, when we think about just research alone and some of the institutes, and granted they have graduate students who, who work in them, but they're not delivering that integrated education, which is that combination of you know coursework and research, um, in many cases also some forms of service. And, and working with our graduate students, I think, is just a, a, a really important part of what we do. And, and thinking about faculty just by themselves is insufficient. Um, so I don't know if that completely answers it. But I think, and your point about organic, it's so crucial that those efforts do come up from the faculty. Um, it helps to have an institutional champion, someone who will recognize or support that. So whether it's a dean or, you know, the provost, depending on where it is, um, is another important thing. But again, I don't think it's something that can necessarily be orchestrated top down. Um, I think I'm I'm frustrated by some things that are happening right now in terms of limitations on what this campus wants to do. Um, and that's that, and that's faculty colleagues from other campuses. So I don't know how I feel about that. Um, I think there's overreach going on. Um, <laughs> oh no! <laughs> um, but I, I think we'll, you know, persist and and be successful in the long run. But. I'd be interested to hear your perspective on the evolution of funding from public to private and how that's intersected with the interdisciplinary nature of the campus and whether or not it's the enemy and if not, how the university has sort of sold this interdisciplinary, multi multidisciplinary benefits to the investors that are now mostly private. That's a great question. I, let me say first of all, um, the first 50 years of this institution, um, uh, you know, people like Phoebe Apperson Hurst wrote checks to bail out the campus. And it wasn't until the mid-20s um, when we sort of switched to this idea that we should be funded almost entirely through the state. Um, and, and there's always been private philanthropy associated with the University of California and with most other higher education institutions. Many of it directed toward things like um, the first chair on this campus was in East, was East Asian languages. It was called the Oriental Languages Chair, but it was, that was the very first chair on the Berkeley campus um, funded privately. Um, and uh, so I look at it this way. We have a public mission, and I don't care where the resources come from, except to the degree that I, I think we should turn down certain resources if they come with inappropriate strings. Um, and I have no qualms with doing that. That's hard, but you ought to do it. Um, but one of the things that really struck me again when I came here from Stanford was the really serious and, and deeply felt way in which my senior faculty colleagues took that public mission as not just for granted, but just critical to what we were doing. And, and I think if we continue to focus on that, not necessarily who funds us, but what we do with the resources that we have, that's what matters, what we do. Not so much, as I said, as long as it's not money that we really shouldn't be taking. Um, and frankly, we're going to depend on philanthropy and other things much, much more than we used to, given the, the, the state. You know, our solution in, with some of the budget cuts in the early part of this century, where there was headroom, was to increase tuition. But that put a much greater burden on our students and their families. Um, it was not something we particularly wanted, we meaning the system, wanted to do. But there really wasn't a choice. And there was some headroom. We had the return to aid strategy, so we knew that our low-income students were always going to have um, scholarships. Um, but we got to a point where politically that tuition was getting too high, um, and then we had 10 years of no tuition increases. And I can go into a long chapter about the negative impact of that, uh, mainly because it meant that the, the financial aid resources never grew. So as costs went up, you had actually a shrinking pool of financial aid available through the return to aid strategy. So there's a lot of complexity in how we think about our funding. But I think the central thing that's so important is focusing on that mission and what we 
do with the resources that we have. And again, I will say the disinvestment in the university started roughly in 1980 with Ronald Reagan and roughly as the demographics in California were changing from white to brown. I think that's something we shouldn't forget. So there was, an, was there another question? Yeah. Yeah, just kind of continuing on this uh, theme. So I'm a org alum, work, work at the Lawrence Buckley Lab. So I, I just see that at this particular moment in time, especially for a graduate group who's working on kind of energy and climate, uh, we have seen funding increase fivefold uh, in terms of kind of working on these areas, many private schools getting that funding, uh, we have a huge alumni network, which is in leadership positions. It just seems uh, a mystery to me that there is lack of expansion in ERG and this thinking, oh, whether we will survive or not or what would happen. I mean, literally money is flowing like water in the energy and climate space. So it's a bit confusing to me that why when a John Doerr school gets a billion dollars. And it's not, it's not, I'm not saying that it's just a Stanford issue. It's, I, I would argue that it's a momentum time for this particular topic. If, if, if ERG doesn't consolidate and expand at this point, when would it? So it's, it's pretty confusing that we are not able to consolidate and expand. There's a long answer to that question, and I, I will simply say that, that actually ERG, ERG itself is in decent financial shape, um, uh, thanks to great efforts, on, and fundraising from our alums has been generous, um, and we continue to work on things. We're successful in getting grants. Um, I'm talking about a larger institutional question about, about resources. I would also say that, again, um, faculty time is is more limited, and even though we have now ten core faculty, that really is is you know, two of them at least are are, are shared um, with another department. Um, you know, there there are pressures on on our time um, that affect that. It's also much it has been in the past much harder to get a grant approved today than it was a decade ago, two decades ago. Um, so there's just a lot of factors that come into that. I agree with you. There's lots of opportunity, um, and I think I think ERG faculty and and you know I can well, David's not here anymore, but I think you know faculty in CNR are certainly trying to take advantage of that. Oh, Duncan, if you have an answer for that, <laughs> hate to put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, which may be, I don't know if it's, it, if it's leading, but it, it, um, I wanted to know what you think is the right scale for an interdisciplinary enterprise. So sort of building a bit on Ron's question, um, what is the right scale of an of a organization that does interdisciplinary research? You could say it's the entire university. You could say it's two faculty working together with a student. It, what is the scale? So that's a great question. I have actually I've thought about this. And frankly, um, the size that the ERG core is now with 10 is a really great number. Um, I've, I've, I've observed this because, because four was too few. And we relied a lot on, on affiliates and others to kind of broaden that, to, to add in to coursework and things. You know, 10, maybe you go to 12. You look at our most, some of our, although we have actually some departments that are just four or five faculty that are extremely successful, like Scandinavian studies. Um, but I think 10 to 12 is a really good range. There's still a, an ability to have those PhD seminar conversations, um, the ability to provide sufficient mentorship to our doctoral students, engage our master students. Um, you know, you could, we've grappled with this. I mean, over the years, ERG faculty have said, how big should we be? And, and are we doing the right thing by having a more limited number? Should we be 100 students? Should we be 40 PhD students and 60 master students? What would that look like? Um, those are always worth questions. Those are questions always worth asking. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, many institutions um, grapple with or programs grapple with. What's, what's the right scale given... Um, you know, 
what we've been able to do. But I would say that our effectiveness, one of the reasons I think we're so effective and our graduates are in so many leadership positions is that it's not cast of thousands. And maybe that's a little bit of an elitist thing to say, but if we're producing the leaders that are going to have an impact, maybe we are at the right scale. So, Ron, I, you know, it's a good question to ask, and it's something I think we should always reflect on, um, but that, that would be my answer at the moment. Maybe we could grow the number of students a little bit more, um, but we're constrained by, by um, the resources we have to support them, so that's another factor in how we think about this. Josh gets to start and finish. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel bad about this. This one won't be so flippant. Um, how about the faculty time question? That's something that I think a lot of us wring our hands a lot about. H how do we overcome that barrier, and what, what can the university do to allow our faculty to have the time to be creative and support our students better in that kind of with that creativity? I mean, it's why I've been very supportive of, you know, Carol's effort to grow the faculty by 100 lines. We've gotten 30, and, and you know, maybe we were too ambitious in terms of how we thought about framing that, um, but we were also very pragmatic in how we figured out how we would fund, um, uh, you know, 100 lines because that's a permanent commitment. So growing the faculty to me is, is, is the sort of number one priority. Um, the second thing I would say is, I think we do way too much, um, some of you aren't gonna like this, way too much buying out of faculty time. And there are programs on this campus where, you know, you, you do something and immediately, oh yeah, you get course relief. Well, that's not actually helping. And if you get course relief, then we're spending money on someone. We're not only paying you a stipend or doing whatever, we're also then, um, spending money on, you know, a Unit 18 lecturer or an adjunct coming in to teach on your behalf. And I, I've struggled with this a lot because I really do think that, you know, we need to, we need to carry out that part of our mission more completely than, than I think many faculty currently do. And it's hard. We get rewarded for being the head of an institute. We get rewarded for getting a Guggenheim or something else that takes us away. Um, but the number of faculty that are um, off helping run a company, is, I, it's a real struggle to sort of balance what's the right combination. So of that 1,500 faculty, there's a good fraction of them that are not currently either here or and more than just that sabbatical number. So. You know, and I, I understand on everybody's individual level, it's, it's great to get those opportunities. Um, but then from an institutional perspective, I think we need to be more strategic about, about how we support our faculty and how we reward people for actually being here and doing the teaching as, as well as the research. Um, so I'd love to grow our faculty. I'd like to see us spend a little bit more time. And frankly, one of the reasons I retired was to free up my faculty line for a new faculty member coming in. Um, and and I, I you know I'd love to see more of you know my colleagues who are in my age demographic think that way. Um, frankly, <laughs> make room for the next generation. And and life as an emerita is actually really great. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for the hopeful, inspiring, pragmatic speech. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, um, Amanda already has the whole talk. And the one thing we need to do is make sure we get it captioned the right way before we put it up on YouTube and that sort of thing. But I couldn't figure it out. It's like something flashed up.